Thank you. Prior to the public hearing starting, I want to make an announcement so the public will. Today is uh, the 31st of June. It just also happens to be. In, in all this time that I've been mayor, I've never ever turned the microphone button off for a council member. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask Mr. So O'Neill to lead us in the uh, rendition of, of Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Well, that's hot. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, <laughs> dear Richard. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Councillor Asmussen, Councillor O'Neill, you're out of order. Um, and what better way to spend your birthday than with the people you, you love the most? <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, 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 your caring. I will now call the meeting to order. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Richard Stewart. I am 58. <laughs> and, on <be> <laughs> and on behalf of City Council, I want to welcome everyone this evening. This is a public hearing into the bylaws that will be read to you in a few moments by the City Clerk. Council for the City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and has, asked, has ordered that a public hearing be held. Staff from the City's Planning and Development Department will first present a summary of each proposed bylaw, after which we will open the floor to anyone in attendance that wishes to present his or her views on the proposed bylaw. Those that have pre-registered will be given the first chance to speak, and then we'll open the floor to anyone in the room who wants to offer their thoughts on the proposed bylaw. I stress to you all that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity to express views that you might have on the proposed bylaw and to make that view known to council members. Council members are here with an open mind and are here to listen to your input. No one has prejudged the outcome of these bylaws, but it is not a question and answer period. It's not an opportunity to debate the relative merits of the proposed bylaw with either members of council or members of staff, or with those in the audience who hold a different point of view related to the bylaw at hand. So we ask, uh, please, that everyone restrict their comment, comments to the proposed bylaw that's before us, that you be as brief and concise as possible. We ask speakers to limit their comments to five minutes. If you have more than five minutes worth of really good stuff, you can get to the back of the line and, and, and offer some more thoughts after that. We ask that the audience be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to make his or her point without interruption. Here in Coquitlam, we're really adamant that everyone feel comfortable at the microphone. And in order to accomplish that, we make certain that please, no cheering, no jeering, no booing, no, no heckling, nothing from the audience members, even clapping while someone's speaking. We want them to be as comfortable at something that they might not be that comfortable with. As chair of this hearing, I reserve the right to conclude any presentation that doesn't relate to the bylaw at hand, that becomes abusive in any way, or becomes repetitive of views that the speaker has already made known to council members. Please note that if you have written a uh, written submission that you want to be included in the permanent record of tonight's meeting, you have to hand it in prior to the adjournment of that item. After the adjournment of an item, that's handed into the clerk's desk here. Uh, after the adjournment of an item, Council can receive no further information at all except for information that we've requested. We can't receive any further information until we've concluded that item, either voted it down or given it fourth and final reading. Immediately following adjournment of the public hearing tonight, a regular council meeting will convene in order that council can give considerations to items on the public hearing agenda as well as to other items that are on the city council agenda. However, if during the public hearing council requests further information related to an item, we will defer consideration of that item from tonight into another night when the information is available. I will now call on Mr. Gilbert to introduce the bylaws on tonight's agenda and the planning and development staff to make a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Perhaps just before reading the first item, I would invite uh, Councillor Asmussen to make his declaration. He, are, he already did. Just oh, the, this is a different declaration. <laughs> Councillor Asmussen. This isn't. Winston isn't. He doesn't believe Winston is his item. All right, sorry, he's okay. gone. Right. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're, you're good with all three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. So, uh, if an individual council member sometimes uh, yeah. make a determination that they might be too close to an item or live too close to it or something like that, and that sometimes applies to Councillor Asmussen because he does live on the mountain, but uh, this one's okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Clerk. So the item one is an application to amend Steve Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw Number 3000 to rezone the property at 3416 Queenston Avenue from RS2 One Family Suburban Residential to RTM1 Street Oriented Village Home Residential and RS7 Small Village Single Family Residential. This is Bylaw Number 4779. Your Worship and members of Council, Item one is proposed zoning amendment bylaw number 4779 2017 located at 3416 Queenston Avenue. The subject property is located on the south side of Queenston Avenue to the east of Coast Meridian Road. The subject property is currently zoned RS2 One Family Suburban Residential with East Watkins Creek traversing the subject property. Surrounding properties are zoned RS2 One Family Suburban Residential, RS8 Large Family single family residential, RTM1 street oriented village home residential, RS7 small village single family residential, and P5 special park. The northern portion of the subject property is designated street oriented village home, and the southern portion small village single family in the Smiling Creek neighborhood plan. The applicant is proposing a rezoning from RS2 one family suburban residential to RTM1 street oriented village home residential and RS7 small village single family residential to allow a subdivision into eight fee simple lots with sizes ranging from 221 square meters to 287 square meters fronting Queenston Avenue and one RS7 single family lot, approximately 1,282 square meters, which will have frontage on Corba Avenue and Paquette Street. The RS7 lot has redevelopment potential into either a single family dwelling or a duplex. A minimum 10 meter wide streamside protection and enhancement area boundary is proposed for East Watkins Creek. The proposed eight attached street oriented homes fronting Queenston Avenue will each have an enclosed single vehicle garage and one exterior surface parking space which will be accessed from a rear lane. Staff recommend that council give second and third readings to bylaw number 4779 2017. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? And for the third and final time, are there any speakers to this item? I will declare this item closed, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Next item on the public hearing agenda, item two, is an application to amend the city-wide official community plan bylaw and the city of Coquitlam zoning bylaw to revise the land use designation and zoning of 1412 and 1414 Pipeline Road. These are bylaws numbers 4665 and 4666. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Karen Wong, Development Planner with the City. So subject site is located on the northwest corner of P Robson Drive and Pipeline Road. The subject site is also situated within the northwest Coquitlam area plan. Currently the site is vacant and was previously occupied by an animal shelter. Zoning on the site and to the north is RS2, one family suburban residential. To the west includes RS4, one family compact residential. To the east is RS2, one family suburban residential and RS3, one family residential. Zoning to the south is P1, civic institutional. The pump station is located. The site is designated suburban residential. 
in the city's official community plan. The applicant is proposing an OCP amendment from suburban residential to townhousing and a rezoning from RS2, one family suburban residential, to RT2, townhouse residential, to facilitate 12 townhouse units oriented towards an internal road. Access to the 12 townhomes would be from Pipeline Road. The proposal provides for two side-by-side -side parking spaces within a garage for each unit and 11 visitor parking stalls for the entire site. Staff recommend that Council give second and third readings to bylaws number 4665 and 4666-2017. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Any speakers to this item? The third and final time, are there any speakers to this item? Seeing none, I'll declare this item closed. And we'll put lots of pressure on our staff person for item number three. Next item, item three is an application to amend the citywide official community plan bylaw and the City of Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw in order to revise the height and density provisions in the Austin Heights Neighbourhood Plan. These are bylaws numbers 4776 and 4777. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Allison Pickerel and I'm a planner with the Community Planning Division. This evening I'll be presenting the proposed amendments to the Austin Heights Neighbourhood Plan and the C5 Zone with respect to building height and building density in the Austin Heights Neighbourhood Centre. The Austin Heights Neighborhood Center is located along Austin Avenue between Blue Mountain Street and Gatonsbury Street and along Ridgeway between Nelson and Marmont Street. Shortly after the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan was adopted in 2011, a development application was approved at 19 stories and a 4.68 floor area ratio or FAR. Public feedback from the development application focused on neighborhood impacts including shadowing, privacy, views, and traffic. Following this, a moratorium was placed on further high-rise development in to allow for a review of appropriate density and height in the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center. To address the moratorium, a density and height review was undertaken and included public hearing feedback from the Austin, located at 955 Austin Avenue, neighborhood center policies in the C5 zone, the hierarchy of urban centers in Coquitlam, landmark site designation and associated density bonusing policies, and to undertake architectural testing. Coming out of the density and height review, proposed amendments for the Austin Heights neighborhood plan and the C5 zone focus on building height, building density, and the landmark site designation. Recognize the role of Austin Heights as a local center in the hierarchy of urban centers, and support continued revitalization of the neighborhood center. Next, I'll provide further details on the proposed amendments. Starting off with height, staff proposed to introduce a maximum building height of 25 stories, and the existing four-story height limit will remain for areas along the south side of Austin, between Marmont Street and Gatonsbury Street, and south of Charlotte and east of LeBleu. Density. Proposed amendments will incorporate the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan, or the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center, into the citywide density bonusing program. This will include a reduction in the base density from 3.0 FAR to 2.5 FAR and a maximum FAR of 4.0. Consistent with the city's housing affordability strategy, amendments are proposed that will allow additional density in exchange for affordable and or special needs housing. This has been a successful tool that's been applied elsewhere in the city and staff are proposing to apply this policy in the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center. This provision could allow an additional 1.0 FAR up to a maximum of 5.0 with building heights not to exceed the 25 story height limit proposed. The proposed amendments could increase financial contributions towards affordable housing and amenities and encourage the development of new rental units. Landmark sites. It is proposed to remove the existing landmark site policies and associated 1.5 FAR density bonusing provision 
and introduce gateway design policies to serve as prominent entrance or focal points in the neighborhood center with no additional FAR provided. The proposed amendments recognize that a high level of design and streetscape improvements should be standard for redevelopment. Next, I'll provide further information on the housing affordability strategy and possible shadowing impacts from high-rise development. Coquitlam's housing affordability strategy was endorsed by Council in 2015. Through the HAS, Coquitlam will work with partners, including the nonprofit, private, and public sector to ensure that a variety of housing types, tenures, sizes, and prices are offered. Proposed amendments could encourage new rental development in the Austin Heights with the exemption of rental floor space from maximum density allowances. Could leverage the city's affordable housing reserve fund, which acts as a financial contribution towards partnership-driven initiatives aimed at increasing the supply of housing for low and low to moderate income households. If the C5 zone is brought in line with the citywide density bonusing program, a portion of density bonusing contributions are proposed to be directed towards the affordable housing reserve fund. Recognizing the role of Austin Heights as a local center in Coquitlam's urban hierarchy, a maximum 600 square meter floor plate provision and a 35 meter tower separation provision were introduced as part of the implementation of the original Austin Heights neighborhood plan. The 600 square, ma square meter floor plate provision will be carried forward and proposed amendments to the C5 zone will further clarify the tower separation provision and introduce a minimum 30 meter diagonal tower separation for buildings that are offset. Public concerns related to high rise development often relate to shadowing, privacy and views. These provisions will help reduce shadows cast by buildings, improve privacy between towers and allow for views throughout the neighborhood. As part of the density and height review, architectural testing was completed in the neighborhood center. The testing was not a design exercise, but was intended to understand possible building heights and density scenarios. For illustrative purposes, a shadow study was completed using, using the architectural testing building model to provide a visual representation of the impacts of a sample development area on surrounding streets, the public and private realm in terms of access to sunlight. To help communicate the shadow study, a time-lapse video has also been created as part of this presentation. The sample block selected from the architectural testing model is located along Austin Avenue and Ridgeway Avenue between Nelson and Marmont. Building heights in the video range from 15 to 24 stories, have a 4.0 FAR, and range between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. during the summer solstice on June 21st. Based on the information provided tonight, staff recommend that Council consider second, third, and fourth and final readings to bylaw number 4776 and 4777 and lift the moratorium on processing high-rise development applications in the Austin Heights as established by the Council Resolution on July 25, 2011. If these bylaws are approved, a 25-story height limit would be established in the Austin Heights Neighborhood Centre. The C5 zone would be brought in line with the citywide density bonusing program. The current landmark site designation and associated density bonusing provision would be removed and gateway design policies will be introduced into the neighborhood center. Thank you, Allison. Councillor Hodge. Yes, just a question on the affordable housing. Uh, it's on page four of the report. Um, currently, so if we reduce the uh, maximum uh, uh, FAR from, I guess, or 
from sort of the base of FAR from 3 to 2.5. Um, currently on the citywide affordable housing um, fund, 50% uh, of the 3.5 to 4 lift goes into the fund, if I have that right. It's at 3.5 that that contribution ki kicks in. Is that correct? Mr. McIntyre. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, thank you. Um, in, in the 3.5 to 4 increment, 50% um, of that comes to the city, and 50% of that, half of that, 50%, goes to the Affordable Housing Reserve Fund, the other half goes to the Community Amenity Fund. Right. And so that we would still, a building could still achieve that because if we lower the base to 2.5, they would still pass through that 3.5 in order to hit the, the maximum, which is 4, but we would allow an extra 1 FAR yeah, if, if they put rental in because we would not include that that's essentially giving them an extra one, but that would be on top. Not, it would not allow them to reduce that 3.5 FAR. It would be on top of that. So they can't use that to stay below the 3.5 is what I'm getting at. Uh, through the chair, uh, that's um, exactly correct. Um, as uh, Allison mentioned, the proposal, and like it was described by Councillor Hodge, is um, to bring the C5 zoning for Austin Heights in line with the city's established bonus density system, which just as Councillor Hodge described, in those 0.5 increments, half of that 50% of the 0.5, the 3.5 to 4 goes to affordable housing. Um, now, what else is being proposed is to, uh, as with the other um, higher density zones in the city, is to uh, make available a further 1.0 floor area ratio for projects for affordable housing, rental housing. So that would be on top of the, of the four FAR maximum. And in that case, it would be within the project itself. It's not a transferable bonus density between uh, projects? No, that, that's, that's correct. We haven't, we haven't seen that. The idea is to fully utilize the, the, the uh, bonus density opportunities for the site, and then if you pass to that point, and if there's still an interest in, in adding for rental housing, affordable housing, that, that uh, ability is there. And it could be transferred within the site, so they could do one tower here, one, and they could, it could move it between the towers. And the reason I ask that is we often hear from residents who say, well, the city doesn't do anything for affordable housing, but in fact, we do it differently because we do it with a contribution. So instead of having three or four units in a building, we allow a developer to make a contribution and then we spend that contribution. In this case, they would still do that, but they could have that one, one FAR in the building. So in which case it could be within the building and a contribution to another project somewhere in the city. Uh, again, through the chair, that, that's correct. Okay. And um, in fact, recently with some of the projects we've actually been seeing, projects coming forward and applying for credit from the city's affordable housing reserve fund to get units to below market market rates. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Towner. Thank you. Uh, it says in the report here, June 30th, as part of the public consultation process, that there was a, a mail out as part of the Austin Heights density and height review. A mail out was sent to property owners, tenants, and stakeholders. Can you please tell me how many letters were sent out? Through the chair, approximately 700 flyers were sent out to property owners, business owners, and tenants within the neighborhood center. 700. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pickrell. Anybody else? No. Okay. We have a speaker's list on this one, uh, beginning with Rob Batos. There you are. Rob is at Unit 112, 1177 Howie. Save time. Yep. The one that doesn't look like it has a microphone, it's the podium and it does have a microphone. Uh, good evening, Richard, or sorry, good evening, Mr. Mayor and fellow council. Um, my name is Rob, Rob Bottas. Um, I've lived in Coquitlam since 1978, but more importantly, I live in the Austin Heights area since 2004. I've been both a renter in the area and I'm now a property owner. I can tell you right now that if I had to buy into this area today, I could not afford to live there. I probably couldn't afford to live in Coquitlam. Um, do I like the idea of towers coming to the area? No, I don't. However, if in densifying the area, it will get more purpose-built rental housing. I don't mean market rate because a lot of people in my area can't afford the market rate 
There's a lot of people that are seniors, um, disabled people, um, on limited incomes. Um, if we're going to get more purpose-built families subsidized housing, great. I think that's fantastic. But if in changing this bylaw, all we're getting is more market rate condos, which that's I'm sorry, but that will that's going to affect property values or not property values. It's going to affect other people's cost of living. There will be a trickle down effect when owners of rental buildings that are getting old and decrepit see that oh, I could put a tower up. You know, I'm concerned how this is going to affect the people in my neighborhood. So if we're going to get more purpose built rentals. Stuff for families, low income people, great. If we're not, then I'm not in favor of this at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Randy Webster. Unit 100, 3001 Gordon Avenue. Mr. Webster, good to see you. Hello. Good evening. Hello. I, uh, I'm here uh, as a representative for the uh, Tri City Chamber of Commerce. So I'm just going to read our, uh, our endorsement of, the, uh, of this uh, lifting of the moratorium. So. Um, the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce supports lifting the moratorium to allow for more density along the Austin Heights corridor. We support, in principle, a mixed development which includes retail, services, office space, and residential. An additional 5,000 citizens entering the Tri-Cities is a rare opportunity for our members. These people will become the consumers, employees, entrepreneurs, medical, legal, accounting professionals for our members. Furthermore, the investment dollars flowing into the Tri-Cities has numerous economic spill-offs. Those construction workers that are building the buildings are also the ones that are buying the sandwiches at the sandwich shops. Greater housing supply is needed across the Lower Mainland to provide more affordable housing options and greater public transit, transit infrastructure. It is with these, all these factors in mind that the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce supports lifting the moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Wilson. Actually, I have a question for Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, you're going to get cross-examined by Councilor Wilson. He's our toughest. Thank you for coming and representing the chamber. Um, do you have a rough idea of, of how many chamber members are in the neighborhood center and how they specifically feel? I can understand the chamber themselves being in favor of the changes, but I worry that some of the, the business owners in some of these buildings um, may not want some of the changes because they'll uh, entail much higher uh, leases, uh, possibly. Uh, fair enough. Um, we have not heard that feedback from, the, from many members. Um, but there is the uh, Austin Business Improvement Association that I know has been, uh, has been working with, uh, with their members to get some feedback on the, uh, on the process. And um, I'm not representing that group, but I, I know that they have their own You. No, that's good. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, the, uh, of course, the local neighborhood, the um, uh, Business Improvement Association was part of the original um, dialogue back in the 2009 through 2011 range, and in fact, we're, we're driving force in that. Okay, our next speaker is Phil Buchan, and he will correct my pronunciation, and he's at Unit 305 at 1110 Howie. Yeah, it's Bucken. Bucken. There you go. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, I'm happy to speak about this, uh, this is a bylaw change. Um, yeah, I live on, I live on Howie Avenue. I live in a small three, three-story building, and I... If, yeah, if there is affordable housing that's included in these buildings, then I will support it as well because I'm the same as Rob Batos. All the people that live around me are low-income families and seniors and other people who cannot afford. I pay about $900 per month, but I think market rate would probably be 1500 or 1400 Like, I can't afford to pay that with my job. So... I would just like council to think about the people that are living in that area which, and just think about their opinions. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, excuse me. Oh. All right. Um, you, you, you said market would be 1500 You pay 900 Is that a subsidized rate or is that a, a not 
Uh, well, that's the market rate, but I think if those oh, new houses are built, I would say that's, for the, that's just my estimate about what okay, sorry, the I, cost I miss, of the new apartments would be. Misunderstood. The, sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So you do pay market today yeah. for the older units. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, and our last scheduled or last uh, registered speaker is someone that's known to Council Chambers. Uh, he's, he's, he's actually known to police too, but in a good way. <laughs> Thank you, Worship. I wanted to point out. And I will introduce him now. His name is Neil Nicholson. <laughs> oh, my goodness, look at that. <laughs> we had a colleague here who often. Um, Rarely dress, wore long pants. Yes, dressed down from the knee down. <laughs> uh, Neil Nicholson. Uh, Thank you. At 1189 Eastwood. Mr. Nicholson, please. Thanks very much. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here and talk about this. We talked about it a lot longer six years ago, I think. Six years ago, the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan was adopted by this council after extensive consultation. <laughs> perhaps even more consultation than we wanted to hear, but it was good consultation. Many of us will remember that as extensive though that consultation was, residents differed. They didn't think they'd been consulted. And I was one of the people who sat there and said, really, you know, there were four open houses and there were all these different things. But apparently our memories are short because today we're proposing to amend the plan to permit buildings much higher than those that raised so much public comment, mostly negative, last time, and to do it with a minimum of public consultation. Consultation this time around consisted of letters. I wrote letters, but I now hear it was a flyer, only to those occupying or owning properties now being allowed additional density, those directly affected the inside the yellow border. I remember hearing clearly, hearing from many residents in the surrounding area, we've heard from two tonight, about the impact of high-rise development in their, on their quality of life. Shadowing, traffic, park usage, change in the makeup of the neighborhood as people lose the ability to live there, the economic ability. I want to ask, I want to ask Council to delay dealing with this proposal until generous public consultation has been conducted, similar in scope to that conducted years ago. I'd further suggest have one problem with the report. A basic thrust of this is to revoke the moratorium put in place six years ago. The report to council indicates that moratorium is attachment one. It's not there. It's very difficult to speak to a moratorium that's proposed to be revoked when I can't read the language of it. But hopefully you will go into further consultation and the next time I come back, I'll be able to read the moratorium as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this, of course, is former Councillor Neil Nicholson, who voted on, uh, for the moratorium uh, back then. Um, and for the plan. And for the plan. Uh, I just have... Um, and I, actually, I'll go to Councillor O'Neill, because I think he probably has the same question. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this will be a question to staff uh, by way of explaining or um, maybe answering... Uh, uh, declaration that uh, Mr. Nicholson made about this plan will allow um, this new plan will allow uh, towers to be much higher than in the old plan, and therefore he uh, that's one of the fundamental reasons why he wants more study on this. Um, can the planning staff please tell us uh, what the effect uh, of this plan is compared to the the uh, existing plan, the older plan, in terms of allowable height? Worship to uh, Councillor um, O'Neill. Um, as I bring my thoughts together here, uh, the difference between um, the, the existing plan before the moratorium was put in place, a portion of the neighborhood center had a four story height limit on it, and that's a portion um, of the neighborhood center to the south. Um, what we're proposing here is the, or the, under, the, under, the, um, under the current plan, there was no height limit. So it was, height was determined by FAR. What we're proposing under this plan is to put a height limit on the rest of the neighborhood center up to a maximum of 25 stories. So with, um, with no height restriction in the, the old plan, the, cur the current plan uh, as opposed to the proposed new one, 
Uh, it all depended on uh, FIR, and therefore, it, it, with a big enough lot, uh, you could have seen quite a high uh, tower of much higher than 25 stories. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. Okay. That uh, clarify things for you, Mr. Nicholson? I don't have access to the records from six years ago. My recollection is that it was with great difficulty that we came to the height that we allow for the present high-rise. And that, in my mind, and I believe in the minds of most residents, was effectively a limit. We're not going to go taller than that, but we're not going to think about it for a while yet. Well, my but but my, my major point remains the lack of effective public consultation on lifting the moratorium and redefining the height limit. Thank you. I wasn't. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. I'm not redefining the height limits, placing height limits, because there were no height limits before. The, we could have built a 40 story tower under the plan that you voted for. Changing the measurement method, then, if you like. Going from an FAR No, it's actually imposing limit. a height limit, because there was no height limit before. You voted on a plan that didn't have a height limit. We're now imposing one at 25 meters if this goes forward. Stories. 25 stories, sorry. So. And you're saying that this isn't as good as the plan you voted on in 2011? I'm saying it's different from the plan that was voted on in 2011. The difference is sufficient that it should have gone to the same level of public consultation. It's yes, there's now a height limit, but there's also a significant change in the FAR. And so are the, is there, I'll, I'll ask. I'll, Councilor O'Neill. Yes, sir, so just a. I wasn't on council when this uh, first came up, but I certainly recall, and I had a run for council once. I'm and sure was, you were paying attention. Uh, I was paying attention. And, and I recall that the lone existing building that's currently there now was originally proposed to be uh, several stories higher and could have been even higher. Um, but uh, in the wake of uh, public feedback um, that, uh, that was reduced to the current 19 stories, I believe. Um, so... Um, and, and, and I, I recall as part of that original argument that, uh, or discussion that, that, that people were saying that there could be even higher towers and there could be lots. And that, that was one of the reasons that I recall hearing, uh, that I re recall uh, the council decided to put the moratorium on was that uh, the prospect of many large, high, very high rise towers. And uh, so uh, my understanding of this plan is that uh, um, that the, with the height limit, um, that, that concern would be taken care of. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Asmundson. Yes, just on the same vein, I was here when this was passed before, and the zoning for the Austin Heights on the, on the previous plan was the same zoning, and Mr. McIntyre can correct me, as what you would have in the city center. And what we've done here is we, actually, we have reduced the level of FAR and what can be built in this plan. I, I'll go through to Mr. through the chair to Mr. McIntyre. How much of FAR is increased under this proposal? We we switched from the city center, which would have been the same type of zoning allow or height allowance as stories, and we've gotten rid of that and come down to a a lower standard. Mr. McIntyre. Yes, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, that's correct. I think, as noted before in the original staff presentation, uh, the base has been reduced down to 2.5, and what is proposed is to um, then have that step up in 0.5 FAR increments up to a maximum of 4, which would have been... Uh, and I think that's the point Councillor Asmussen was making. That would be less, appreciably less than what the city center is, and that's about a five. Um, and less than other areas, too, like our transit oriented uh, corridors along the um, North Road, uh, Clark Road area, like a 4.5 there, and FAR again. Um, now, it's, it's a little bit like comparing apples and oranges for Austin Heights, because the previous plan did allow for. And I'll look to my colleagues here just to correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was up to a 5.5 um, maximum. It, it was a combination of both density and urban design, uh, building design uh, benefit. And so it, it could result, I think it was up to a 5.5. 
um, density, which would have then exceeded what is allowed in the city center. So the, the, what's proposed here is to bring it in line with the city's, uh, which we feel quite successful, uh, bonus density system in other areas, and also sort of in sync with that, again, if you will, you know, you know a five FAR city center, 4.5 in the transit-oriented development areas, four in, in the Austin Heights is more of an urban village area, I would suggest. Thank you, Mr. McInter. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, and Councillor Reed. It's also site constraint. If you remember, the site was odd, and there was a laneway that we had to do a bit of a road exchange on, and the site was a little smaller, and that's why we ended up at the 19. Actually, I think. Say we, I remember one. <laughs> yes, you can say we. Well, in fact, yeah, I, I, I think my, by my recollection, it wasn't us that imposed the 19, it was the proponent that came back and said, well, how about 19? Because I actually preferred the 24, um, and I know several other members were fine with the 24 because we thought it was a better building, but it got shortened to 19. But because of the site constraint in the corner and the fact that there was a new building, I remember this very well, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. okay. Well, I'll make one final point is regardless of FARs and height limitations and all the rest of it, Councillor O'Neill effectively said what I believe the people want to hear about. The reason that the moratorium was imposed is because of the concerns in the neighborhood that we would have more higher buildings. And now we're allowing more higher buildings. And I think they would like to have the opportunity to say to have their say about that and to have it brought a little more forcibly to their attention. Thank you. Okay, and, and not to put too fine a point on it, <laughs> but we've now reduced the FAR and imposed a height restriction. So we have fewer, higher buildings. In fact, we don't have, we have shorter buildings. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think we're gonna agree to disagree, but I thank you very much and good to see you again, Councillor. Yes, Sorry. I look forward to you. <laughs> Take care. That's it for our speakers list. Uh, are there any other speakers to this item? Good evening, Mayor and Councillors and staff. My name is Fiona McQuarrie. I live at 1112 Rochester Avenue and I've previously made a written submission. Uh, on this matter. Um, I'd like to support what Councillor Nicholson said about the uh, issue with public consultation in this, uh, in this matter. Uh, I participated in the Austin Heights consultation um, and I can state as someone who does not live within that yellow outline that at that time uh, consultation was uh, solicited from beyond the immediate area of the Austin Heights neighborhood shown in the map here. Uh, that same sort of notification hasn't happened and I think it's significant in this neighborhood because that commercial center is a commercial center for several blocks around that area, not just for the residents within that area. Uh, I have been out of the country for the last couple of weeks and just had the chance to go around the neighborhood this afternoon. Uh, I saw two signs notifying residents of this uh, of this hearing, one in the parking lot behind the TD Bank on uh, Nelson, and the other at the corner uh, near the old post office on Ridgeway Avenue. I would submit that both of those signs did not really represent the scope of what is being proposed here. They were very similar to the signs that we see in the neighborhood when there's a redevelopment application for a single uh, property. Uh, I would support uh, Councillor Nicholson's call to defer a vote on this matter until there's been more comprehensive consultation on this issue because I think what is being proposed represents a significant change that will have a very large impact not only on that area but on the surrounding area. And I would like to uh, see the same sort of uh, input solicited that was done when the original neighborhood plan was developed in 2011. And I realize also that it's summer and people are away and they're doing other things and it's hard to get them to come out for issues like this. But uh, I, I would support the contention that there hasn't been adequate public consultation here. And I would also ask council to defer a vote on this matter until that consultation takes place. Thank you. Thank you. Next. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Jane Shoemaker, and I live on Howie Avenue, which is just barely outside the yellow line. Uh, with regard to what the previous speaker said, I also took part in the consultation process, was it five years ago, when we, a group, large group of us came together to help to, to get a vision of what we wanted our neighborhood to look like. Uh, we were divided into small groups and we made, using blocks, we made models of the height of buildings we wanted. And in general, people did not want high rises. That's the general feeling. Now, uh, that's history now. I want to say that the Austin Heights neighborhood is very valuable to the people who live in it. They tend to, or many of them are low income people, seniors, people with disabilities, and it's a very good area because there's plenty of low cost housing. People who do not have cars can walk to their shopping and their doctor and post office and whatever they need and the park. It's, and then there's the, the bus that goes down to Lougheed Mall. So it's a very desirable neighborhood for this type of person. And you, you just try to imagine if you are the person with living uh, with a walker or a wheelchair or you're elderly and you don't have a car. Um, I want to know this is, I suppose you won't be able to answer this question really quickly, but I, as one of these people, I would really like to know why can't you build apartment buildings, maybe shorter, that are 100% low cost with none of these fancy furbelows, no granite counters and, and uh, you know, special bathrooms and everything, just one plain ordinary bathroom and, you know, the kind of thing, the sort of thing that they used to build. Why can't we build that sort of thing so people can afford to live there? The country is one of our problems. Apparently, it's that the Canadians are seriously in debt. There are way, way many people who are over their heads in debt. And a big reason is they are being forced to pay more for their housing than they really can afford. Why can't we make buildings that are all low cost? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, this is my first council meeting I've ever attended. Uh, my name is George Springman. I am a business owner in the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center. I'm also a landowner in the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center, and I am also uh, a resident of the immediate uh, Austin Heights uh, Neighborhood Center. I didn't say this at the beginning. I, when you come up to the microphone, please give your name and address for the record so we can make a note of it. I'm at 1300 Austin Avenue in Coquitlam. Thank you. My name is Jordan Springer. Um I'm a member of the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm also a member of the Austin Heights Business Improvement Association. Um, I'm here to say that um, as a business owner, uh, I am in favor of the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan. Um, it means more customers. It means uh, you know uh, stronger businesses. It means a better future for me and my family. Um, and the increased density also means that people that are my age can actually afford to uh, own their own home in Coquitlam. Um, you know, not just subsidized housing, but um, you know, even these nice towers that are going to be built someday will be places that people my age and younger can actually afford to own a home in Coquitlam. And without the redevelopment of this area, um, something like that, like single detached home for somebody my age is almost unachievable. Um, and uh, to have these towers would be somewhere that a nice place that somebody my age or younger could be able to afford to live with their families. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Oh, Councillor Hodge, sorry. 
Right, I, I, I can have this question for staff, but it's uh, for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll we'll hold you for a second then, sir. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councilman. My name is Joe McStravick. I'm a lawyer at Drysdale Baker McStravick, and we are in the Austin Neighborhoods Center. Uh, we're actually right across from uh, the John B. Pub and Rona's, so you get the idea. That's the white building. And I'm also one of the owners of that building. We're certainly in favor of the development for the Austin Heights. A couple of things that I'd like to point out that I was thinking about from a standpoint, both as a business person, our building that we're in now, um, I understand buildings have a lifespan, and our building is coming to the end of its lifespan in the sense of uh, uh, things are starting to fall apart. As they do, you're going to have to either reinvest or you're going to have to modernize. I've been in the Austin Heights area for uh, since 1981, 1982. The thing I've noticed about it is there's been very little modernization, very little uh, upgrades, and I think now's the time to do that. If you look around the rest of the city, that's what they're doing. Uh, there's got to be a reason for that. Um, I'd like to stay in the neighborhood. Even our business, the plan is that um, when there's a development, we want to stay in the neighborhood. We don't want to move out of this neighborhood. We're well known in the neighborhood. So uh, I think uh, Council Wilson was asking about that. Certainly, uh, that's what we're planning to do. The second point, and I think the young gentleman stole my thunder there, is um, when these places are going up, these towers are going up, there's a large uh, amount of people in that neighborhood that also are baby boomers. Their children have grown. They want to move out of their large homes. They're selling their homes. They don't necessarily want to move out of the neighborhood. Well, these condos that are going to go up would be an ideal place for them to live and they would be able to stay in their neighborhood. I don't live in the neighborhood, I live in Port Moody, but I've seen the Newport Village development. Uh, I've seen how the people uh, go there in the weekends, go there in the evenings. It can become a real center for these people to attend, to, including myself, and um, I'm really looking forward to what it's going to look like. It's very exciting. Um, I think it's a dynamic sort of thing that we can all watch grow. That's my position, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTravick. Uh, Councillor O'Neill, uh, well, I'm going to go with Councillor Hodge first. Uh, Councillor Hodge. Thank you. Um, we've heard from a number of business people uh, tonight, and uh, earlier we heard from a couple of residents, one of them concerned, I guess, about loss of, of, of current housing in the area and what the cost could be uh, for market housing. And this plan, um, looking at it, uh, just the aerial here, it, it seems to be it's mostly commercial. So any development would be residential on top of commercial. But how many residential units, do we have any idea of how many residential units there are within this area? Not necessarily including the Austin, which is new, but looking up along Ridgeway, I'm just wondering what is the potential for, for home loss uh, of existing stock? Do we have a sort of a rough estimate? Sorry to this question out of the air. So, so not, not counting the BD Tower. Not the counting the new BD Tower. How many residents in the yellow hat? For Your Worship, um, let me try to respond while staff look for... Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm okay if we want to go on to another uh, res somebody. Well, well no, I, I, I appreciate the question, and, and I'm going to go a little bit from memory, plus my knowledge of walking that neighborhood. Uh, I think the Austin you know, just like whispered in my ear. There's none. It, it's a commercial area. You walk along Austin Avenue from uh, Blue Mountain off to the west, all the way through down to Gainsbury, um, and it's a busy, um, aging, uh, commercial frontage by, by a large one story, some two story with office above. Uh, we were fortunate to get a new office building rebuilt uh, recently. The north side of the street, much the same. Uh, there's larger open parking lot areas, uh, the, you know, the Safeway store and that. And then you go up under Ridgeway, and in the, the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center only uh, encompasses that sort of mid-belt of Ridgeway, where the old post office was, the Legion, and the shops again across the north side of Ridgeway. So it, it, it purposely excluded 
the apartments at either the east and west ends of the uh, Austin Heights neighborhood. And just on that, if I could, um, I know it's interesting to hear from the residents right nearby and certainly appreciate their views. Um, but just to be clear, the, 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 the recommended or um, OCP, official committee plan amendments, are just pertaining to that area outlined in yellow along with the zoning. The OCP designations and zoning and building heights would all remain the same outside that center core area. And thank you, because that was going to be my next question, is that any buildings outside that come down would be almost one for one replacement, albeit at a, at a higher standard with the potential for a, a, a higher rent because it'd be new. But that would be simply because of businesses or, or I guess development wanting to take advantage of commercial activity or other in this area if this goes through. So it, there's no direct impact other than sort of the, the collateral impact of, of development in the neighborhood for anything outside the yellow. And with inside the yellow, uh, there is some housing, but the bulk of this is going to be new housing that doesn't exist today if this goes through. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hodge, yes, that's correct. And if uh, at some point in the evening we're able to get sort of a rough count on uh, numbers, that's great, but I don't need it, need it right sorry, away. But sorry, the, did, the, did staff not um, give us the actual number? Uh, not counting the Austin, it's zero in round numbers? Through the chair to Councillor Hodge, um, not counting the Austin, it's uh, zero. I missed that. So, okay, well, there we go. Thank you. So it's not just an increase in housing, it's, it's, it's not even a net increase, it's absolutely an increase. Okay. Councillor Wils, Councillor O'Neill, sorry. Yeah, it's actually sort of the flip side of uh, that is that I think I detected in uh, at least one of the presentations, maybe from uh, Ms. Shoemaker, that um, about the wonderful shopping and uh, services uh, that are available along Austin and a lot of the older established buildings and, uh, and businesses. And, um, and I wanted to confirm my understanding of the C5 zone uh, maybe uh, members of the public don't understand what the zoning is going to be for here. C5, and that's, uh, um, that's a combination of commercial on the base and residential above. Um, so it's not, uh, they may have in mind uh, some towers in the West End or something that, uh, that are just from the ground floor up, and some towers in, in the city center here and, um, that are off the main streets from, from the ground floor up is... Uh, completely residential. My understanding is C5 zone is commercial on the base and uh, so my understanding would be lots of opportunities for businesses to reestablish themselves. Is that correct uh, to the planning department? Mr. Gawley. Through the chair to uh, Councilor O'Neill, yes that's correct. Uh, under the plan it would be uh, two to four stories of commercial at the ground level with an opportunity for uh, housing above. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Wilson. I don't want to be a nitpicky, but I believe just to the east of the Safeway building, there's a small apartment with maybe eight, eight units or so. Uh, so. My goodness, you're right. I, I, sorry, it's behind the laundromat. Yes. Your Worship, to Councillor Wilson, uh, my apologies. I stand corrected. We can see that here now, too. There are, there are eight units there. Yep. I'm guessing. Or so. Yeah, it's either six or eight, I would think. That's yeah, a two story, I believe. There you go. Hmm. Okay. Councillor Cirillo. I just wonder if it's possible to get a slide. Could we see the slide showing the current zoning if this moratorium gets lifted? Would what the current zonings would revert to for this this area? Right now we don't have any Hmm. I don't believe that slide formed part of the original presentation. Is it found in one of the attachments to the report? Uh, Your Worship, uh, we'd have to to dig for the zoning. I think we might have a, um, a fish committee plan land use designation map we could show. Okay. 
Your Worship, to Councillor Zarello, uh, we don't have the existing zoning map here, um, but the majority of the uh, area currently is C2, and I'm just looking up the designations uh, under that uh, zone right now. So I just want to confirm we're not changing any of the zoning, so everything will just revert to where it is. We're just, we're just putting height uh, restrictions on, so I would like to see that as part of this public hearing, the, the zoning. Very seldom do I have the document that planning staff are looking for. <laughs> it's usually the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, through the Chair to Councilor Zerillo, uh, so the map on the screen is the existing OCP land use designations in the Austin Heights neighborhood plan. Um, and through the proposed amendment, there are no changes to those designations. Um, and the area in red is the uh, community commercial designation where the C5 zone is a corresponding zone. And that's uh, the area that is uh, the subject to the, the matter at the public hearing. So everything in the red is C5 right now? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Most of the properties maintain their existing zoning of whatever their current use is. So that's what I, I want to see. Do we have that? The existing zoning of those, uh, okay. Um, yeah. But part of the public hearing is saying amend the C5 zone to incorporate this, bring the C5 zone in line, add the C5 zone, and we don't see where the C5 applies. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you give us a moment, we're going to uh, try and bring up Q the map and use that as the okay. source for that. So uh, uh, you can either proceed with. Um, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm going to proceed to the next speaker uh, since this isn't related to a specific speaker but a general question. So we'll come back to the Councillor Zerillo's question in a moment. Is there any other speakers? Sir. Your Worship members, my name is Chris Bacon. I'm a lawyer at uh, DBM at 1015 Austin Avenue. We employ 30 people, some of whom have a hard time finding uh, an affordable place close to work. I've worked uh, at this location for 24 years, and my observation has been it's, it's struggled a bit. Uh, stores uh, open and close periodically. There's not a lot of uh, stability in the area. And I wonder if that's because it hasn't had enough population density to support it. And I'm wondering if it's a wise idea to put a limit on building height. I think if I had a, a vote on this, and I don't, I wouldn't limit building heights to 25 stories. And I think the city of Vancouver made that mistake years ago. I think that uh, typically more population density will have some salutary effects on the neighborhood, some that I've noticed. Uh, are more green space because you can uh, uh, limit the amount of ground required to support people. More public transit. The public transit up and down Austin Avenue is not that great. When I end up taking the bus, sometimes it's an hour between buses. If you have more people there, that drives more. You're looking at me skeptically. The 152 goes down to 50 minutes per uh, per run. Yeah. No, even during the day. No, you're wrong. I'll, I can prove you wrong. Anyway. You're out of uh, order. <laughs> you might be right, but you're, you're out of order. But certainly it's, it's uh, conceded that um, there will be more customers for businesses. And when you go higher, you get more concessions from developers, including below market housing, more affordable housing, and more uh, amenities generally. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Councillor Asmussen is going to offer uh, some alternative facts. Well, uh, just, <laughs> you, you, most of you may know, but you may know, I'm a bus driver also. I drive the 152. It's up 
is between 10 minutes to 20 minutes day base on that during between the peak and rush hours. It's a frequent service and part of the plan in the future with Transling is to bring it to a frequent transit network is down to 15 minute service. But right now it's operating at a 20 minute service and it's used quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Every hour I'm going to. Oh, we've got the answer here. There we go. Here's the zoning map uh, pulled up from Q the map. This is the existing zoning, uh, although what's before us today is the future. So, Councillor Zerill. Yeah, so within a bunch of the bullet points here, we're having amendments to the C5, bring the C5 zone in line, add to the C5. So, I assume that we're anticipating, since I only see two C5s right now, that we're going to have quite a few rezone requests in here if this passes today or we're anticipating that, that's why we're getting ahead of it. Is that, is that why we're doing that? Uh, through the Mayor to Councillor Zavrillo, uh, yes, that's correct. Every individual development application would also have to apply to rezone their site um, under the uh, neighborhood commercial land use designation of the plan. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, uh, anyone else? Just step up. Aaron Davidson, 1672 Thomas Avenue. I don't know if I have to get my address, the whole address, but anyway, I live in Coquitlam, have for 30 years, and um, was part of the original Austin Heights neighborhood plan process, which, in my opinion, was highly collaborative and um, was um, also, I would agree with Mr. Nicholson, um, almost was overdone to some degree. I thought that it was so well done. Uh, it brought in a lot of expertise. It definitely um, reached out to the local neighborhood and, um, and again, was a long process. Uh, the moratorium was placed, and I do applaud you for addressing that and putting it back on the table because it's actually very overdue. So let's move forward make some decisions, decide what this is gonna look like in Austin Heights. I don't have the magic number about what a tower should look like. Um, I know my interest is definitely in revitalizing Austin Heights. So is that what that means? That, um, you know, a tower supports businesses if it brings in people. I know sometimes there are some businesses that feel that their rents may be affected. Maybe that's some of the outfall that is unfortunate. Um, in terms of the local neighborhood, um, and I hear a lot about the affordable housing, and really that's what I wanted to um, uh, make some reference to more than anything, because I do think it is important that we support those that can't and struggle to own homes and pay rents. So the partnerships between developers, I think, is a beautiful thing, and I think if we can really continue to encourage that, you know, that they are part of the solution, and they can incorporate affordable housing within their structures, um, and that they are contributing in terms of funding. I think that's great. There's lots of models out there that have been very workable, and so let's continue down that road too. Um, but I know when I was part of a roundtable discussion and we were looking at, and again, the Austin Heights plan didn't just magically appear, um, as most of you know who were uh, involved in the process last time around. Uh, you know, it was a morphing, really, of a number of different visions. And a lot of people have in, had input into that um, end result. And they were people that lived in the neighborhood, and they were developers, and they were architects, and they were landscape planners. And um, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, there was a very comprehensive plan that was put in place. So I think that does give you a very great working model to, to work with. Um, you have to make a tough decision tonight about what that end result is going to look like. Um, I don't want to be in your seats tonight. Um, but in terms of the affordable housing um, issue, don't forget, part of what that plan was tasked with was how are you going to assimilate 5,000 people into this neighborhood? It's not about whether you want to assimilate 5,000, but that's the projected number. Coquitlam's really working towards a 20-year plan of how to assimilate 20,000 people this area was tasked with how are you going to incorporate 5,000 people over that same timeline. So how are you going to do that? 
uh, when they looked at morphing those plans, some of the plans were about creating towers from Austin Heights to Blue Mountain Park. Uh, how about, you know, going back to the residential neighbourhood and subdividing and creating, you know, fourplexes on single-family homes. All of those things were reviewed. And one of the options was to create more density along an existing commercial core. That was the rationale behind it. And again, I'm not supporting towers and, or not. It's about looking at rationale. And one of the, uh, and the reason that option was logical was because it actually um, reserves some, the affordable housing from Austin to Blue Mountain. You know, we, that affordable housing market that's there, it, 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 it's in existence. And one of the ways to preserve it a little bit longer, the intention was to, to maybe take a look at creating those towers along the strip instead. So if that's the case, then maybe there is a win-win by creating that density along Austin Heights and preserving that affordable housing uh, market in behind. So I just thought I would share that little piece that I recall that was, to me, really pretty significant when we were looking at that plan originally. So. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Nope. Next speaker. Anybody else? Please step forward. Good evening, Your Worship, Council. Uh, Josh Adelberg, 901 DeLester Avenue. Just wanted to defend the individual that uh, mentioned about uh, bus timing. After 7.10, it is uh, every half an hour. And at 9.10 p.m., it is every hour. Just to clear that up. Thank you. <laughs> Not hourly during the day. Well, it sounds like on average, it's about what was said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It is frequent during the day. It's less frequent at night. Okay. Uh, someone over here was coming forward. Please step forward. Um, my name is Carol Yamamoto. Uh, I live on Charland Avenue between Nelson and Marmont, uh, closer to the Nelson end. Um, I have a few points to make. One is that I did not receive a flyer of any kind. Um, I know many of the people, many of my neighbors on Charlotte Avenue, and nobody has a clue what is going on. Um, having come to the meeting tonight, I can confirm with my neighbors that there will be high rises in the Safeway area, but as far as any other area of the Austin Neighborhood Center, nobody knows. We're all only guessing where the fourth story is, where the eighth story is, whether there will be any high rises sort of in the southwest corner of Nelson and Austin, which would affect us the most. Um, I would like to see another flyer sent out, whether it's after the bill has been passed or, or before. Uh, we really have no idea. Um, my other concern is I'm not, I am not opposed to higher density, but my concern is traffic in the area. It's already very congested on Austin Avenue. People use Charlotte Avenue as a way of avoiding the congestion on Austin Avenue. Um, we have speeding. We have trucks going by there that deliver to Safeway that should not be on that street. And... Obviously, it's reasonable to assume that that situation would only get worse with increased density. So I would like to know what, how the city is going to handle the increased traffic in the area. Okay. Mr. Diozeghi. Thank you, Your Worship. The Engineering Department Transportation Planning Division has carried out a traffic modeling. And that model was prepared uh, during the previous process, so it dates back to 2008. However, the horizon year is 2031. Uh, according to this model, which is currently being um, updated, the uh, level of service at the key intersections, such as Austin and Blue Mountain, 
Austin and Mormont, Austin and Gatensbury, as well as Austin and Schoolhouse are acceptable. In the same sequence, the level of services C, C, A, and A. A is the best, um, F would be the worst, which is a failure. So uh, for 2031, the level of service uh, for all of these intersections will drop. Uh, at Blue Mountain, it's going to be D as in Dennis. At Austin and Nelson will be B as in Beta. Um, and um, Austin and Mormon would be operating at a level of service E, which is the worst of all of these intersections. However, uh, we are working on remedial options, and I'll get there in a few seconds. The Gatensbury intersection in 2031 is modeled as a level of service B, as in beta, similarly to schoolhouse, which is again B, as in beta. Now, what we are working on is uh, for the worst uh, intersection at Marmond, we are looking at uh, as development should proceed uh, at the vicinity of the intersection, we are looking at adding additional lanes by um, asking for dedication from the development properties. And with that, uh, we have some degree of confidence that the level of service, while it's going to be worse than today, still it is going to be in the acceptable range. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. We've had a few uh, residents speak about the consultation process for, for this particular uh, item tonight. Um, and I can't remember back to when this was discussed and what the consultation was going to look like, but I was, I was under the impression that there was going to be, you know, some open houses and that sort of thing. So um, it looks like the only people who received um, information on this, according to the report, were owners, developers, and tenants within the neighborhood center, so within the yellow line, is that correct? As well as other stakeholders like TransLink and School District 43. But, uh, anybody living on Charland, anybody living on Howie, anybody living on on, on Nelson, uh, below Charland, uh, would not have received any information about this report for tonight. Your Worship, to uh, Councillor Wilson, the approach we took uh, with uh, doing the height and density review was a a very focused approach. And so as part of that approach, um, we did uh, reach out to the uh, property owners through flyers, approximately 700 flyers. Um, and then uh, from there, we've used uh, social media, our project web page, um, and the public, feeding, uh, public hearing feedback from uh, 955 Austin, the Austin uh, development application, uh, to do the height and density review. So that's the extent of the consultation that we've undertaken. Your Worship, if I just <clears throat> add to that, and I know the questions come up around the signage, um, and this is one of these ones where it's almost known as damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, under the legislation for a public hearing where there's 10 or more properties with 10 or more property owners, uh, all that's required is um, notice in the paper. Um, in this case, as, as Steve was describing, there was um, consultation with specific property owners within the affected, directly affected area. Um, in addition to that, there were signs that were placed um, in and around that, um, the Austin Heights Neighborhood Center just to advise of the public hearing. So it's sort of over and above what's called for in the legislation because, again, you have no more, you have more than 10 properties owned by 10 property owners. So um, there was some effort to taken to um, kind of publicize that with, within the area um, uh, under consideration. And, and I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but was this advertised? This was advertised in the newspaper as a regular public hearing item, correct? Yeah. And so the signs that were up were were not necessarily descriptive signs about what the public hearing was about, but just to say that this was a, an item in the public hearing. Uh, that's correct. It was one of our um, standard public hearing signs. It would have said that it was item three and referred people to uh, the public hearing part of our website so that they could look at the first reading report. So I understand, you know, the extra effort it takes to do a broader consultation, the extra cost, uh, that sort of thing. But um, 
and I, and I know this was part of a large consultation back when it was originally, um, when this plan was originally developed, but so I would have figured that we would have done um, a little broader consultation um, six years later. Um, and it sounds like some of our residents would have appreciated that um, as well. Um, the, uh, the some of the and, and because there was no consultation, I mean, I, I think some of the residents are probably curious, like our, our previous speaker. So, she, she, simple question was she was asking about um, the uh, northeast corner of Nelson, for example. Um, basically, to to help her understand what this could look like, um, is it accurate to say that anywhere along the northern part of Austin? Um, there could be towers. Um, the northeast corner of, uh, of uh, Charlotte there would could be a tower. So anywhere in the blue, I don't know where which she went. Anywhere in the blue, there 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 could be a tower. Anywhere in the brown would be a, a potential four-story building. I don't know if that uh, helps you understand it any better, but that's what this. Um, Yes. Mr. Merle. Just a second, please. Yeah, uh, through Mayor Stewart to Councillor Wilson. Um, yeah, as, as per the original Austin Heights neighborhood plan, uh, anything in the um, uh, community commercial or neighborhood center kind of designated area um, has the potential to apply uh, to redevelop for a high rise should council lift the moratorium. Um, but recognizing Austin Heights role as a local center, uh, certainly th those towers need to have a smaller uh, floor plate as well as be spaced further apart from each other uh, than you do in other high density areas of Coquitlam uh, to try to improve views and, and minimize the shadowing impacts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. May I speak again? You can't yet. Okay, sorry. I have to go through everyone that wants to speak and then we'll, we'll start a second row. Uh, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, please step forward. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Mayor and your council, my name is Debbie Rasmussen. Um, I am the owner of Rosemary's Treasures, uh, 1041 Ridgeway, oh, 1041C, Ridgeway Avenue in the Yellow Zone. And um, I've only been the owner of Rosemary's Treasures for two and a half years, so I'm a very new member of the business community there. I raised my children, though, um, in Coquitlam. They were, uh, one of them was born on Marmont Street almost, um, but we did make it to the Royal Columbians, so I'm a I'm oh, dyed in the wool. Literally born on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm dyed in the wool, Coquitlam. Um, gone to school in the area. Been part of this community all my life, except for a few little diversions. I'm excited. I'm very excited about the opportunity of changes. I'm um, worried for our our community and for our neighbors because. When you're in Rosemary's Treasures, you get to meet everybody in the community and you get to talk to them. And I've heard some worries, so I, I'm going to entrust that you'll be thinking about those things as you make your decisions. I don't know how much um, authority or uh, power there is to adjust things, but if there is an adjustment to be allowing for more affordable housing, I'd certainly be in favor of that. I, I don't know how the powers work in that, but there's a ratio, so there's always a ratio that can be tweaked. I think we've heard from some people here tonight that have spoken to that, but I've heard from many. Um, as a business owner, though, um, I'll let everyone speak for themselves. I just would like to say that it's an opportunity for all of us, and yet there's some fear as well, being a small or a very, very small business as I am. I purchased Rosemary's Treasures with the dream of being here for a long time. And I don't mind if that gets bigger and I don't mind if it gets newer or refreshed or refurbished or more beautiful. 
but I am also um, reminded of things like the Canby route and what happened to the businesses as they were under the shadow of renovation, change, demolition, etc. I have neighbours who want to continue to be where they are and raise their children in this community and I want to retire in this community and I want to do it as part of the business community. So I would ask that there be consideration, communication, a plan to keep the heart of Austin Heights, your small businesses. Rosemary's Treasures has been there for 33 years. Some of our newer business members have pinned their dreams recently in this community. I hope there is a plan to allow us to survive until we can all enjoy this together and retain the culture and the history, some of the flavor of our wonderful little Austin Heights. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for having such a wonderful store. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. It's a wonderful store. <laughs> I was just in there a couple of weeks ago, bought a whole bunch of stuff. Um, any other speakers? Good evening, uh, Mayor Stewart and members of Council. My name is Peter Huggins. I live at 367 Seaforth Crescent. Um, I'm here tonight to voice my support for the proposed amendments to the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan. My wife and I have lived in Coquitlam for over 24 years, and although we're not in the area defined by the yellow box, we are within two kilometers walking distance of the area. During our time living in the city, this area has undergone little or no change and now exists basically as an underserving business district with virtually no new development and no enhancement to the public realm. In our opinion, the changes proposed would enhance the area immensely by first bringing new people and families to the area and then allowing the commercial growth that typically follows residential development to flourish. <laughs> I understand the concerns of those who have spoken in opposition to the proposal tonight. Most of them are more directly affected by development in Austin Heights than I am. I do, have, however, like to think that we are all interested in improving this area. Improvement often comes in the form of increased density, especially today. One only has to look at key areas of Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, and our own city to find examples of this. Examples that are both successful and not successful. If projects are sensitive to their surroundings through good urban planning and design, the spin-off becomes a benefit that we can all enjoy. Improve retail opportunities, more green space, better upkeep and more sustainable buildings are just a few of the public benefits. The onus is on the developers, the designers, approving officers and eventually council to sort out the good from the bad. In my opinion, I feel your approval of this proposal tonight, tonight is a start. Because we don't live in the area, we didn't receive notice of the original plan in 2011. We did, however, keep in touch with changes through reading the newspaper and frequenting the city website. Having attended all of the original public information meetings, the public hearing for the original OCP changes, and the subsequent approval of the Austin project, we were disappointed to learn of the moratorium since that time, six years, or 25% of our time in this city has passed, and the area remains the same, sitting idle and aging. Opportunities for the creation of a vibrant district continue to be lost. As with all of Metro Vancouver, land in our city continue, continues to increase in market value. With soaring property values, I believe we can't sustain continued growth without building up rather than out. In that respect, I support the concept of a mix of towers comp complemented by some four-story apartments to assist with the transition to the adjacent single-family residential homes. Lastly, I would encourage Council to consider each future application carefully, particularly in light of its ability to provide options for affordable and purpose-built rental housing, improvement to the public realm, and as to how it provides a consistent mix of commercial and residential space thereby offering residents the ability to live, recreate, and shop 
in a true walk to village atmosphere, one that could be unrivaled in Metro Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other speakers to this item? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I My name is Tanya Roberge and I live at 1050 Howie, so just outside the little yellow box. And I'm actually quite new to this process. This is actually the first time I've looked at the city website. Um, I've only moved in five years ago, so again, it's all new to me. Um, but I just want to, I'm not opposed to the redevelopment. I think that's a wonderful thing. I would just like to point out that there has been the studies about shadowing, but I would also like you to consider the privacy issue as we would be right behind that Ridgeway block. So in making, thinking about that, there's the privacy, the sun, and the view that we would lose being on the block behind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? The third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Oh, sorry, no, you did ask to speak a second time, so please come forward and then I'll go to Councillor Zarillo. I'll go after her, I thought that we were That's fine. I'll be very brief, I'm Jane Shoemaker again. Um, this is a revolutionary idea that would, uh, with regard to traffic, when I was in Prague in the Czech Republic, I stayed in a place right close to uh, public transit where they were building low-cost, 10-story apartment buildings with no parking. And the people who, who bought these units or rented them were people who did not have cars, but they were right close to the transit. And that really kept down the cost of the apartments if, the, if no parking had to be dug underneath the building. That would make the places much more affordable. Okay. Councillor Zerillo. Thank you. I just have a few questions before we close. Um, my first question, we're looking at bylaw four, just to verify, we're looking at bylaw 4776 and bylaw 4777, is that correct through the chair? Waiting for a that is, that is correct. The bylaws that are coming forward this evening are bylaws numbers 4776 and 4777. So I just wanted to verify, under which of these two bylaws are we lifting the moratorium? Through the chair, uh, to uh, Councillor Zarello. Um, the moratorium would be, uh, was a resolution, so it would have to be lifted by resolution, which would be, um, which would be our second uh, recommendation. Sorry, where's that? Okay, so I'm just looking that in my. Yeah, the resolution would have been a council policy, not a uh, bylaw. Okay, is that in my papers here? Mr. Clark. Yeah, it would be listed in both the public hearing brief and if uh, Councillor Zarillo was to turn to the regular council agenda this evening under item seven, it would be um, the second part of that recommendation uh, the council lift the moratorium uh, as, as stated here. I'm just looking, I'm just in the public hearing brief right now, so what, where is it on the public hearing brief? So uh, item three, um, the public hearing brief isn't uh, numbered uh, by page, but it's numbered by item. Okay. Um, the staff recommendation is at the near the top where it says recommendation and the yeah. same the same wording that is here is there. Okay, I'm looking for it. Uh, near the uh, recommendation portions at the top of yep. oh, four bullets. Four. Uh, it says uh, uh, of item three. No, 
but I'm looking in the public hearing brief because this public, is what people got, right? This is what people got. So in the public hearing brief. Public hearing brief is the uh, item, not the agenda. But the public hearing brief is the uh, first item under your uh, under your red tab. And the first page is item one. Second page is item two, and the third page is the start of item three. Well, at the very very beginning of the folder, not on the item. No, the, the, yeah, the, the, agenda, the agenda package contains simply the first reading report because that was all that was um, put into the first reading? Yes. I, I may have mentioned it in the report. I, I don't know. I'd have to look to planning staff, but uh, the recommendation for this evening would not have formed part of the first reading report. Okay. My point. The bylaw tonight is not, doesn't include lifting a moratorium. That's not bylaw language, that's policy language, and it's not really um, something that we're, that, that is the public hearing. The public hearing isn't about lifting a, a moratorium, it's about the bylaw language. That, that is correct. Um, the, by, the public hearing is about the, uh, the OCP amendment bylaw and the zoning bylaw amendments, um, and the moratorium is, is, a, is a result of their moratorium being in, uh, in place by resolution and is being removed by resolution. It is not the subject, the specific subject of the public hearing. It's not a. Um, I, I've given a lot of latitude to speakers that were speaking about that because clearly that's one of the items that they want to contemplate, and it's okay. perfectly normal that we would contemplate that in this context. So I just want to be clear. So right now we're we're on a, we're in a, hug, a public hearing that's talking about bylaw number four seven seven six and bylaw number 4777. But when we close this public hearing and we go into our regular council meeting, we'll, we will look at this uh, bylaw 4776, 4777, and the addition of lifting the moratorium. That, that is correct. That's the staff recommendation that will come before council in the regular. So I just wanted to clarify that, that the, the moratorium is not part of the public hearing. Um, okay, the other question I had was just around, we've heard, we've heard some uh, talk about um, market rentals and I, I remember a, a, another project that we did where market rental, not purpose-built market rental, but just market rental was classified as special needs housing. So I just wanted to clarify, as we're looking at these changes to the C5 zone, Will any type of market rental be eligible for uh, FAR increases under the title of special needs housing? Mr. Merrill. Through the chair to Councillor Zarillo, um, the special needs housing is um, a mechanism in the zoning bylaw to designate uh, certain sites uh, to be eligible for the potential increase in density. Um, the, the additional 1.0 FAR that's allowed for under the housing affordability strategy. Yes, but what is the definition of special needs housing? And does it fluctuate or does it have a definition? Because we've, we've incorporated before um, market rental as being special needs housing and we've given FAR for it. So I just wonder if we're, we're looking at bullet number three on 4777, add the C5 zone as a corresponding to, zone to affordable housing and special needs housing in the zoning bylaw. So I want to know if, if market rentals would, would be considered special need housing in that third bullet under the C5 zone. Uh, through the Chair of Council, Zerillo, uh, yes, the, the mechanism that's used in the zoning bylaw to enable the additional density both for purposeful rental and for below market and non-market rental is to categorize it as, as special needs housing. Okay. Uh, my other question is, in the C5 zoning, I know we've just got a few bullets here, but in the C5 zoning, there's quite a bit of talk about tourism and how um, access points for tourism need to be on the first floor and things like that. So it makes me start thinking about Airbnb and that sort of thing. So is there special accommodation in the C5 zone that if this goes forward today that these all don't turn into Airbnbs with, with um, some sort of um, amenity space on the first floor and stuff like that. Like there's, is there any mechanism in place for that, for protection of that? Uh, 
Through the Charter Council Zervillo, uh, there's uh, no language in the C5 zone um, about Airbnb. Okay. Um, the language about tourist accommodation is uh, a hotel use is an allowable use in the C5 zone. Yeah. And should someone want to build a hotel, the, the, those are the policies that would apply to that form of development. Okay, because I read the C5 zone as talking a lot more about tourism than just hotels. And I just want to make sure that we're protected from, from turning it into a Airbnb area. So what could we do to ensure that um, this C5 zone doesn't turn into a bunch of Airbnbs? Uh, Your Worship, um, perhaps I'll try to address that. Um, and and, and this, this concern's been raised before, and, and I think you know, certainly given what uh, we see happening around the, the Lower Mainland, um, you know, it's worth asking the question. Um, as Andrew was pointing out, uh, in a number of our commercial zones, um, and you know, mind you, some of these commercial zones have been around for a long, long time. Back to a day probably when there was motels on the low heat highway. Um, it, it allows for tourist accommodation use in, in, in those zones. Um, more recently, and certainly the, you know, the trend these days is to see mixed use. Um, and the C5 zone would allow for that, as does the C4 zone, the C7 zone. And so theoretically, you could have that issue where in a mixed-use building, tourist accommodation is permitted, and it's commercial at grade and residential above. Could some of those residential units then be converted to short-term rentals because of tourist accommodation? And uh, there's a number of... Um, Restrictions around that. First, it, it doesn't meet the uh, specific wording of uh, uh, a home occupation uh, bed and breakfast in the city zoning bylaw. Um, there would also be, for licensing reasons, there would need to be the um, permission of the strata, and that wouldn't be um, likely forthcoming. And thirdly, too, and I can't get into the details because uh, they're pretty uh, uh, pretty specific, um, there are certain... <clears throat> regulations in our C4 and C5 zones, I believe, and C7 for that matter, where it starts specifying uh, commercial uses above residential. And it, it, the way it's been explained to me, it would make it very, very difficult for that type of arrangement to um, uh, be made. All that said, though, I know this has been raised before around Airbnb or the short-term rentals, and um, it's something that's not really addressed in the zoning bylaw, like you know, we don't really regulate, um, we regulate by land use, not by tenure, and certainly not by duration of tenure. Um, but I think there are enough uh, existing provisions in there if, if such um, short-term rental was being operated in a building and it was brought to the city's attention, I think there's enough um, ability for the city to uh, um, enforce on that. I'm going to have a, a deeper look at the tourism part of it after. Okay, so um, on 4777, the first bullet is about amending C5 zone to incorporate uh, something specific for the Austin Heights Neighborhood Centre. And we've heard a lot of talk tonight about the interest in affordable housing. And I'm wondering if there is any opportunity to add, and obviously not today because we can't add things in a public hearing, but I want to understand if it's even doable to have something added to the C5 zone that talks about um, affordable housing for a specific neighborhood like Austin Heights Neighborhood Center. We're doing it here um, to specify the 25 story height limit, but I'm wondering if there is an opportunity to outline it in the C5 zone in a future time for any specific neighborhood where there would be a, a requirement for um, affordable housing, or when I say affordable housing, housing affordability that allows for purpose built rental or Subsidized housing, is that a possibility? Mr. McIntyre. Yes, um, yes Your Worship, thank you. Um, currently, staff are uh, have been busy working on, um, there was like 10 action tasks coming out of the uh, housing affordability strategy that was approved by council back in uh, December uh, 2015. And uh, we're making good progress on that, and there's some things actually we'll be bringing forward uh, very early in the fall um, around uh, looking at the parking ratios for, for rental housing. I think that's come up earlier this evening. Um, amenity standards and some other provisions. Um, so I, I would suggest if there's um, 
questions or interests, that would be the time to raise that. And um, uh, we, I think we could have a look at that, those, those sort of suggestions in, in, in that situation when um, there would be a recommended approach for bylaw amendments. And so I see how that would fit in with that package there. Okay, so speaking just, let's not even speak about housing affordability, let's just speak about identifying specific neighborhoods in a zoning. So we're gonna to add to the C5 zone some specific wording for Hostin Heights Neighborhood Center. That can be done for any, any, any topic. Like obviously, if this happens, there's going to be a section of the C5 zoning that's only applicable to Austin Heights Neighborhood Center. So is that having those specific to, to having those comments to specific neighborhoods is possible in zoning is that true and I'm just thinking about in the future if we want to add things to zoning we can do it neighborhood specific in the zoning bylaw uh, through to chair Councillor Zerillo um, yes council has the the opportunity through uh, zoning amendments to designate special provisions for certain neighborhoods okay um, for example, in the, the C5 zone today, um, there, there's, there's one set of, of density policies that apply in Maillardville where a certain character is trying to be determined and uh, different density policies that apply in the Austin Heights neighborhood where a slightly different character is trying to be determined. I just wanted to confirm that. And then my last one question is uh, based on a speaker that came up. Um, I know this happened in Berquitlam. We had, this is about protecting small business as we go through these ideas of redevelopment. Is there a plan in place? Is there some sort of protections in place for those small businesses that have been the, the heart of this area for a long time when perhaps there's construction and limited access? Is there a plan in place for that? Uh, through the Chair to Council Zerillo, uh, the um, next step section of the first reading report um, indicates uh, that should Council uh, lift the moratorium and allow redevelopment in, in the Austin Ice Neighbor Centre to proceed, uh, staff would develop a commercial tenant relocation policy, um, very similar to some of our uh, rental tenant relocation policies, um, to bring forward for Council's consideration. So relocation is what we're considering, is that what I'm hearing? Rather than other incentives, it would be relocation. Uh, through the church councils, uh, yes, it's correct, it's relocation. Okay. Thank you for that, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Back one last time. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? The third and final time. Are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing none, I'll declare this. I'll declare this item and the public hearing closed. We'll reconvene microphones and tapes, and we'll get going in about uh, seven minutes.